and uh, thank you very much for getting up so early to listen to this talk. And uh, I actually have an ulterior motive for this talk, and that is that I want to sign up as many of you as possible to help with this problem. This is a very important problem. I think it is really important that we give the control of our data back to the consumers. And the way we're going to do this is by building these open federated virtual assistants. So let's start with the problem. Um, how many people here are on Facebook? Maybe I should ask how many people are not on Facebook. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I suppose a lot of people here well, are familiar or understand the issues of privacy. And um, by now, <coughs> um, uh, pretty much everybody in the world knows about um, the issue. You know, it's like when you have a, s a small number of companies owning billions of people's worth of private information, that's a problem. Okay, I think that Cambridge Analytica is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and uh, because of all these issues, I think it is great that EU passed the GDPR regulation so that people can get their data back. It's a very, very important first step. But it is not so, but it is not enough because, you know, what are you going to do with all these documents that have your data in it? You can't share people, share the data with other people. And what is the ultimate problem? They think that, you know, Facebook is doing what it needs to do, which is to make money. The problem lies with the fact that the technologists have not given the consumers a meaningful alternative. For them to share their daily lives, their pictures, they have to use something like Facebook. And that is something that we need to help the consumers with. That's the story with the consumers. But if you look at the commercial ecosystem, it's not so healthy either. If you take something that is close to our hearts, look at um, the problems of, uh, look at the issue of uh, mobile software. There are these platform monopolies and duopolies that kind of control the market. Um, if you put out a mobile app, you have to give Google an app or Apple 30% of your revenues, okay? I'm not talking about profit, but revenues. How many companies have a 30% profit margin, okay? When you have um, a cost like that, it really drives the, you know, it really slows down the innovation. And this is something that um, it is unheard of. If you look at the PC world, imagine Windows, you know, Microsoft saying is that whatever money you make on the PC software, give us 30% of the revenues. You know, that is, wasn't accepted before. And that is not just about um, software companies. If you look at um, the marketing business, Google and Facebook, they get 60% of the digital marketing revenues in the world, okay? So that has got an effect on the marketing business, but it also affects other businesses like journalism. Just look at the ad revenues from newspaper. It went down from 50 billion in 2006 to 18 billion in 2016. And is it a surprise that we have all this fake news going on? You know, there are lots of issues that are coming up, and I think that we really need to uh, think about these topics as technologists. So what do we have to look forward to? Unfortunately, it's going to get worse, okay? So we saw the how with monopolies, it, it's not good for consumers. It drives down competition and innovation, and the problem is going to continue in the form of virtual assistants. Um, since the introduction of Alexa in about last two years, there are 50 million American adults who have Alexa, uh, who have virtual assistants in their homes. And if you compare that with the growth of the internet, that's like twice the speed because it took about four years to reach 50 million users. Why? Why are people putting these devices in their homes? And the reason is that the virtual assistants have a very, very, very good value proposition, okay? Because today, by now, all our data are scattered all over the place. You know, there are different um, IoT devices, web services, and all our data are in all these different silos. So the virtual assistants come along and say, look, 
Give us all your credentials. I mean, we're going to look at the data, and we will give you a personalized, uniform, natural language interface. Okay. Um, it is so much easier than going and visiting all these different websites, gathering all your data, and doing different things. And so this is very compelling for the end users. But the issue here is that because they are um, now being the intermediary between us and all the different, um, different devices, they have a control over the vendors. And uh, in the meantime, they're delivering better services. So for example, when they saw the email that I'm going to be coming to High Peak, they will be able to send me a plane ticket, you know, because they know my traveling pattern and they know what I like to do. And they can even provide all these services based on our personal information. This is a lot stronger than any of these monopoly platforms that we have seen before. So imagine the following, which is that take Amazon, Facebook, and Google, combine them, plus more, because they will be able to provide the best, the most profitable credit card services, health insurance services, because they know all your personal data. And I want to emphasize that this is to stay, to stay with us. This is really a shift in paradigm. Just think back, right? We used to have mainframes, and when we went to PCs, what did we do? We have to invent the graphical displays and the mouse because now we have the graphical user interface. All right. Now with mobile devices, ubiquitous computing, you know, this is all the progress that all of us have helped have all helped build. Um, we really we need a change in the interfaces. Okay, it is no longer the graphical user interface. Um, it doesn't make sense. You have a tiny little screen. Okay, where is the mouse? Okay. In the meantime, AI has come along, machine learning has come along, and we are now able to do natural language. Absolutely, language, natural language, is the interface of mobile and ubiquitous computing. So instead of a GUI, graphical user interface, we're going to see a LUI, which is linguistic user interface. Okay? So instead of a browser, we are using virtual assistants. There's a big difference between those two. Browser, you can take any browser and visit any web page that you want. But these virtual assistants are very expensive to build. There are really only a few successful virtual assistants. They are completely proprietary. They have control over what you can access through their virtual assistant. So instead of having companies hosting their own web pages you know, and asking people to visit them, they have to put their linguistic user interfaces as skills in these um, virtual assistants platforms. So for example, Alexa now has 50,000 skills, and, um, and each skill has multiple functions, and Google is saying that they have over a million functions. Okay. And what does this mean? These platforms are open, but they are not, but they are not, but they are proprietary. So in a sense, you can think about this, it's, very, it's a little bit like the AOL wall garden. They have a control over, the, over who, what you can access. Um, Alexa is not going to let you buy anything other than from Amazon, for example. Google is going to say, okay, I'm not going to support Bing search. Um, so they have the control, or maybe they say, okay, you can come to me and I will take maybe 30% of your revenues if you sell services through our browser. Okay, this is all just waiting to happen. So what do we do? So this is a problem that I've been thinking about for um, oh, yeah, I just want to summarize that what we are witnessing is the beginning of proprietary linguistic webs. And we really have to do something about this. So this is a problem that we have been thinking about for the last three years, and we have a project we called um, Almond. So there are several points that we want to achieve. Number one is that we don't need many proprietary webs, linguistic webs. We need one open and non-proprietary linguistic web that is open to all virtual assistants. And for this, we are building a, uh, we are building a repository. We call this 
Thinkpedia, okay? It's a little bit like Wikipedia. It is crowdsourced. It's available. Anybody can put their user interface into their, it, the linguistic user interface as skills into these repositories. It's open to anybody who wants to build a virtual assistant, okay? So that's the number one goal. Second, it is very important that now, at the beginning of virtual assistants, that we take care of privacy. So we have been working on this idea of an open, federated virtual assistant. It's open technology that means that anybody can take this technology and provide uh, and build upon it and provide that as a service. Okay? And it is federated. That means that the virtual assistants can work together to, so that we can help the consumers share data between each other. So the model here is very much like email, right? I mean, in email, um, there is an open communication standard, and um, different uh, companies can provide the service. So a lot of uh, consumers get to, you know, they don't want to run their own service, which is uh, available to people who want to, but they can park their data with any of the providers. They can take a free service and perhaps get ads out of it, or they can even pay somebody and so have their data be protected. But what is important here is choice, okay? When you have something like on Facebook, there is no choice. It is, you take it or you leave it. But what we really need is a technology that allows a lot of competition. We give people choice, and then we will be fine. Because there are people who give you services that protect privacy and those who don't, and let everybody pick. I've been thinking about privacy for a long time, and what I realize is that it doesn't work if you want to build a system only for people who care about privacy. You know, have everybody run their own server. You know why? Because if you do that, you will get a network of very antisocial people, okay? So what we really need is interoperability between people who care about privacy and people who don't. So that's the second point. Now, the third point is, probably, is the most important one, in a sense, because it is something that technologists have not been thinking hard enough about, and that is adoption. When we say that we want open source, if you just take existing commercial products, turn it into open source, it's not good enough, all right? You are not going to get consumers. You have to deliver consumers something that they want, better functionality. And here, so what we think we need to build is the best virtual assistant technology in open source. There is a huge opportunity here because it is still early. If you look at virtual assistants today, you say, turn on the light, it turns on the light, you know, open the door, opens the door. It, that's not much of an assistant. Imagine your secretary who works like this. It's like, you know, everything that you want the secretary to do, you have to spell it out one at a time, okay? That's not a real virtual assistant. A virtual assistant does a lot more for you. The opportunity here is that we all have data in all the different silos. Today, the people who own the silos own the data and they control what we can do with it. You know, thou shall declare that uh, you have these friends and we will share data to your friends and maybe friends of friends. You know, they control how we do everything. But with a virtual assistant, we have a chance to get the, get the control back. What we are saying here is like, these are all my accounts. They're open to me. I want to be able to connect them so that it is not just a matter of turning on the light and um, opening the door. I can say, for example, if it's going to rain tomorrow, let, you know, remind me to bring an umbrella. I don't need to look at the weather report every night. This is really important because with IOTs, you know, IOTs are generating a lot of data. Why are we trying to look at the data ourselves? You know, that's not how a secretary works and that's not how an you know, a good assistant will work. So you want to be able to say, you know, when these things happen, do this for me, okay? And so we want to connect the, the different resources and share them with who, what, when, how, where, according to what we want, okay? This is the time. This is what the virtual assistants can do. So what is the technical idea behind this? We, cons we call this programming. We are building code that never existed before, okay, to fit my own personal need. That's why we call it programming. 
But when we say it is for consumers, it has to be programming in natural language. So I'm still working on compilers, <laughs> but I'm now working with the highest level of programming languages, and that is natural language. I was like, okay, so what are you talking about? You're going to take natural language and translate that into what? Uh, into Java, into Python, you know? Nope. You know, we have to match what the consumers want, and there is plenty of opportunity here. Let me show you an example to illustrate what we mean by programming in natural language. So take this person, um, Bob, he's unfortunate, he, unfortunate that he has asthma. Um, but imagine that he has a privacy preserving virtual assistant, Almond, you know, the project that we have. And there are lots of things that are out there digitally that can help him. Okay? So he can just simply say to his virtual assistant then that when I use my inhaler, you know, record my GPS location in this log file on box because I want to know where I usually get into trouble. So instead of him doing it by himself, he can just tell his assistant to do that. Or he can say to the assistant, you know, if there is an emergency, if I'm taken to the hospital, let my dad know, okay? So this virtual assistant is going to track his whereabouts constantly. But it is fine if this virtual assistant preserves privacy. Maybe it is running on his own devices at home. It is not known to any third party. And only when it is necessary is the information shared to the right people. So medical data, obviously, very, very personal. And it's very, very useful if you share them. So imagine a doctor, um, say doctor, his doctor, Dr. Smith, he can pro provide him with better care by asking the virtual assistant to do the following, which is, if Bob's peak flow meter dropped below some um, threshold, let me know, OK? So the doctor is immediately alerted if there is any real-time information that he needs to attend to. And what it means is now the doctor doesn't have to go and examine all the patients. Some of them are just perfectly healthy. You know, it's just a big waste of time. But now we have IOTs. We can, but if we can connect all this information, we can deliver better health care at the lower cost. So in the, the, you know, another example is that um, Dr. Smith can say, look, um, Bobby should not be running when the, uh, the air pollution is bad. So he can just say, you know, if the air quality index is above some level and he's running, warn him. So these are all little pieces of code. Who is going to write this code? Is, he, is Bob waiting for somebody to put a asthma app together that happens to have all the bits and pieces that he needs? No, I mean, that is kind of a big waste of the power of programming. What we want to do is to put the power of programming um, at the hands, in the hands of the consumers. Okay? And I would say that today, the way we build software, um, the software just cannot satisfy this long tail of user needs. And most of the time, people are just building software that has the best monetization value. And, you know, we need to change that. So I've been using examples of consumers, but you can apply this to any professional services. Doctors need assistance or stockbrokers need assistance. They have a lot of repetitive tasks, and they can automate themselves if they are able to program in natural language. Okay. So let's talk about the technology. So here are the key concepts. First of all, as I mentioned before, we want to have an open repository of skills of all these linguistic user interfaces. We call it Thinkpedia. But there is a big difference between ours and what Amazon and um, Google have. What they have is a repository of intents. So for example, you say, ask Bing to search for something. What it does is that it takes the command, parses it, and it sends what you are searching to Bing. It's a dispatch system, OK? So it's like a browser. You mention that you want to go to Bing, they send you to Bing, OK? That's what the, uh, what the commercial virtual assistants are doing today. But that's not good enough for what we need, because we want to be able to connect all these devices together to give more value to the consumers. We need an interoperable web. 
And therefore, in this repository, we are not just recording the intents. We want the full API signature. I want to know what are the inputs and what are the outputs. Okay, so when I see that the weather is bad, then I can warn the users to bring their umbrella. Okay, um, so that is the first part. So these are the primitives. In today's virtual assistants, commercial virtual assistants, they can only work on hard-coded skills. Whatever they do is in the repository. And what we want to do is to connect them together, so we need a programming language. We created a programming language called ThingTalk. It is a high-level language designed for virtual assistants. And what it has is a very, very high-level but simple construct. However, because it is working with this open, extended Thingpedia, it can do a lot of different things. The more things you put into Thingpedia, the more this virtual assistant can do, even though the construct is very, very simple. It's a very important, obviously, uh, concept in programming. We have a very simple construct. Now, I'm not asking pro uh, consumers to write in ThingTalk. So while now we have to take natural language and translate that into this formal language. If you look at existing virtual assistants, um, what they typically do is that they have a neural network that drop the natural language into some meaning representation, some ontology that they want to cap capture. But in our case, we said, forget about that. We're going to take it all the way from natural language to code directly. Whatever the virtual assistant can do, you can potentially say. Okay, and the one good advantage about this is that you know this is you know, this is uh, natural language independent in a sense. Whereas if I want to capture the representation of a language, a lot of times it's sensitive to the to the uh, natural language that you are targeting. But here, you know, we're just going to do a direct translation from natural language to code. So what do we mean by programming in natural language? Here is a sentence that I said before. When I use my inhaler, get my location, well, you know, I don't really want to record it if it is home because I'm at home all the time. But if it is not home, write it to the log file in box. Okay? So let's take a look at this sentence. When, that's an event-driven program. You're talking about multiple functions, the inhaler, the GPS, box. You need to pass parameters between them. And then you have to put the filters on these values. You are talking about a program. So we take these programming, this programming language in natural language. Now we want to have a formal representation so we know exactly what we are trying to execute. And this is what ThingTalk looks like for that program. You see the three lines of code here? The three lines of natural language corresponds to three lines in ThingTalk. You monitor something, you get something, you can compare if you want, and then you can do some side effects. So this is when get and then do. So this is the construct, it's simple construct for ThingTalk. But even though the construct is simple, it can handle a lot of primitives, and that's where the power of the language sits. And all the primitives are in Thinkpedia. And now you translate it using a neural network. So the Thinkpedia is really a repository saying for this, for any particular call you want to make, how would you express it in a natural language code uh, uh, snippet? So for example, you say when Stanford tweets, then it means, when you say that, that means that you execute that piece of code, monitor, blah, 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 and so forth, okay? So the end user can just refer to them in English, and then the code gets uh, generated. So as we said, we have the full signature and not just the intent. It is a superset of what is available to Alexa and Google Assistant, and that means that our repository is assistant agnostic, taking this this taking this information, you can run a um, Alexa skill or a Google Assistant skill. Okay, so that's what we want to build. If we can get everybody helping building this, then we don't. Then we can open the web up and have a non-proprietary repository. So even if you take the simple, the small. Oh, at this point, we have about two. Oh, actually, we now have about 100 devices uh, in our system. 
And even though it is a relatively small uh, repository, there are all kinds of things that you can do. Here is just a bird's eye view. And what I want to impress upon you is that given all these different functions, there is no way you can build a good GUI to connect things together. This is the power of natural language. So this is what the think talk construct looks like. When something, get something, do something, and you have filters. And with this simple construct, you can do everything that I used in our example with Bob. And you can obviously make up more sentences, like um, when the Bitcoin price reaches some $10,000, search for a Bitcoin picture and tweet it with the caption, I'm rich. You know, you have to automate it just in case the, the, the Bitcoin price goes down again. You know? <laughs> so there are all, you can do whatever you wish. And um, in, as long as the primitives are in the Thingpedia. So how expressive is ThingTalk? It is inspired by IFTTT. How many people here know about IFTTT? Oh, good, good, good. And um, it's a super set because IFTTT has only two clauses, if this, then that, whereas we have this when, get, and do, and, lots, and you can pass the parameters and filters. And it's a crowdsource site, and it has received over 250K unique recipes. That means there are a lot of uses for this very simple construct. And, uh, but IFTT does not have, a, have support for languages. It has a GUI, no formal or no natural language. And probably what is more disconcerting is that it's completely proprietary. If you want IFTTT to monitor your banking account, you have to give it your banking credentials. And I think that is just not acceptable. So we put in open source and we have a full language support. So, so far we're talking about how we can take all the snippets from the Thingpedia and hook them up and generate a program. You know, so I can say, when my car is at home and it is not plugged in, send me a reminder email, right? So that's an example of a, a command that you want to issue. But nobody is going to remember the exact words. So you have to be able to accept all the different forms of natural language. For example, um, I can say the same thing as remind me if my car is not plugged in at home and so forth. So for that, we have to turn to machine learning to help us do this translation. Um, we started working on this over three years ago and for the machine learning part, it took us about two years to get it to work. Why? The technical challenges are, are a result of the fact that there is an interaction between Thinkpedia, ThinkTalk, and neural networks. We actually have to make ma massive changes to the uh, Thinkpedia definition as well as, uh, as, well as ThinkTalk, uh, change the runtime system of ThinkTalk in order to create a clean enough semantics that we can get an effective neural network. And the, this, that's the first part of the problem. The second part is that, you know, you want to do machine learning, what do you need? Data. There are no such data, and this is a problem for a lot of systems people. We want to build new things. How are we going to get, um, exist, you know, how do we get a corpus of natural language sentences? So in the last two years, we worked on the methodology, and then we have built a little tool we call Genie. And what does Genie do is that it takes the language grammar and Thinkpedia representation, as well as templates of these constructs. So for example, we have when, get, do. You can say it in several ways, such as when something, get something, or get something, when something. So you, we leave it to the user of this tool to create some of these natural language uh, templates. Uh, for the constructs, besides submitting the primitive operations in natural language. We take all this as input, and the first thing we do is that we rely on the grammar and generate these training data, the synthetic sentence and program pair. So we generate millions of those, the, those programs. And then, but these programs are just pieced together using different snippets. So what we need to do is to, take, we, is to turn them into some more natural sentences. We take a sample of them and we go to um, crowdsource workers and get them to describe them in natural language. And then we, and, 
So what we found is that most of the people just made small changes to the input sentences. It doesn't create very good samples. So we have to look at the data to extract some of the high-level templates, and then we go back and improve our natural language templates. And that's how we got our system to work. And then we take the sentences, we add the parameters, you know, like all the athletes names or the song names and so forth, and we augment the data, and then we generate a large enough corpus of training data. From that, we train the neural network and we get the trained semantic parser. So this is the tool and a uh, methodology, and that means now you can take this and you can change the grammar, change the Wikipedia, change the templates, and you will get a good chance of getting a useful starting semantic parser. So here are some of the results. The high level is that we were working with 44 skills at that time, and we found that a pretty standard model, seek to seek by LSTM with attention and pointer network, deliver about 87% on the paraphrase sentences. Not the synthetic, but the paraphrase sentences. But these are real, still not the real data, so the next step is that we have to deploy this and get real user input. So, so far we talk about the when, get, do construct. The virtual assistant can do a lot of things for different people, but one of the things we really want the virtual assistant to help with is sharing. Sharing is broken, and this is the reason why we have um, so many people turn to Facebook, even though Facebook um, requires them to give up their data ownership. And the reason is that you already have a virtual assistant that knows everything about you. They can do all kinds of things for you. So they would be a perfect agent for helping you share. You can share anything that your virtual assistant can do. Okay? You ask the virtual assistant to do the, uh, the various different operations, and then you just share the result with the people that you want. And in this way, you can protect privacy with a lot of control. So how do we build this? We just build upon our methodology and our tool. We take the original language, ThinkTalk, you know, this simple construct, and now we add the ability for other people to execute it. So for example, I can say, let Dr. Smith monitor my peak flow meter and if it drops below some threshold. I can say anything that I can say in ThinkTalk and say that this, and then, and then define the person who can perform this operation. And now I have very fine-grained access control because only the result is shared with this uh, person that you allow. Um, here's another example. Suppose you know, I'm traveling a lot and I really want help. I can say, let my father monitor my security camera for motion. Is that a good idea? But wait, you know, what if I am at home? Is my father going to be watching over me, snooping on me while I'm at home? Well, I can use the system, I can improve it. I can just say, only if I'm not home, okay? So I can now add more varieties or more predicates to, to control access, okay, to fit my personal need. So now you can say all the different sentences, there are many different use cases using natural language, which can then be compiled down to an execution. So here is the system picture. It's like, I have my virtual assistant, you have your virtual assistant. And if you want something from me, you talk to my virtual assistant. My virtual assistant executes the commands and gives you back only the results. And so this is the architecture, and we have a distributed ThinkTalk protocol that allows the virtual assistants to work together. And that's where the federation comes from. So let's go into the details a little bit. So here is the father saying that I want access to your security camera. And he says it in English. It is translated into a formal representation so we know exactly what you want. This information is then used by Alice's virtual assistant, Alice is the daughter, um, and the first thing it does is it checks against the policy database and see if the, uh, if the access control is satisfied. Suppose there was no such policy, you know, People are not sysadmins. They are not going to start declaring all the different things that people can do. However, the virtual assistant can then communicate to Alice and ask Alice for permission. Now, here is the most important part. 
We all know as systems people that remote execution is extremely dangerous. You can't have vulnerabilities. People send you a program, you execute it, and you disclose all kinds of information you may not want. And this is where the high-level think talk semantics comes in to help you. Because the program is think talk. The assistant can take the think talk program and translates it back to perfect English description bit by bit, and then, you, and then the assistant can ask the user, is this something that you allowed? Is that allowed to look at the event? As you can see here, the sentence is a little bit more clunky, but that's because it is a really a uh, direct translation. And at that point, the, the daughter can say, oh, Eh, it's useful, but I want to add a constraint, only if I am not home. Now you are augmenting it with more access control, and this information is stored in the policy, and now you, know, you don't have to involve Alice again if the same request comes in. Alice is the one that executes this, um, this program, and the result is sent back to Dad, okay? only when there is motion and only when Alice is not home. So that's how the flow works. So from a technical perspective, what we are talking about is that we have a very informal description in natural language. We translate it into a formal representation, which is these program access controls. And in order to execute it and check for conformance, we drop it down to SMT, Satisfiability Modular Theories. Um, which is the generalization of Boolean satisfiability with theories of strings, arrays, and so forth. And now I'm leveraging existing software, provably correct algorithms, for the sake of conformance and for the synthesis of these for conforming code. We all know SMT is NP-hard, but we have done the experiment and showed that it is fast enough in practice to help the individuals with the kinds of access controls that they may want to put on their system. Okay? So that's the system side. Let's now talk about the really hard part. The really hard part, as we said, you know, we want adoption. Is this really something that people need? You and I understand access control, and by the way, access control has not been improved for so many years, it is really embarrassing. But as you can see here, you know, what we're talking about is access control that is meaningful potentially to the consumers. So we did a study and we want to find out if people need and care about access control. So we went to the 200 people and we asked them questions such as, will you let your teenage daughter use your credit card? Surprisingly, some people say yes, okay? And then we asked them different questions, right? Um, maybe, you know, the, the last one in our example is, will you let your 10-year-old kid to use Netflix? And a lot more people say yes. And then we turn around and we say, what if you can put constraints on these, um, these permissions or these accesses? For example, what if you say to your teenage daughter, you can only use it for restaurants and with a $20 budget, okay? And then we put constraints for the different examples. And, as a, and when we asked the people that, we found out that a lot more people would say yes, okay? So we did it for about 20 different questions ranging from something that people don't want to share to, uh, to things that a lot of people are willing to share. For example, you want to share your location with your spouse, which was the last one on the right. And then we give them the constraints, and what we found is that the number of people who are comfortable in sharing pretty much doubles when we give them the constraints. So we believe that this is something that consumers actually understand and find useful. So how expressive is this very contrived? You know, we have a very simple grammar, right? Does it really work well enough? So in order for us to check the expressiveness of ThingTalk, we also did another study. We asked uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, Mechanical Turk workers for examples. We showed them some examples. We asked them for more examples. We did not describe to them what ThingTalk is. I, we just asked. Can you come up with reasons why you put some access control on uh, sharing? So, for example, here is, an, here, here is what they suggest. 
um, the mom would say, you know, you need to follow this guy on Twitter. He's really good, you know, give me your Twitter account. And the son may say, okay, I'll give you the account, but add him, but just don't add any other people, okay? So this is a constraint that the child may put on the mom. So this is something that they suggest, right? This is very enforceable. To give you an example of something that is unenforceable, here is an example. Um, the friend can say, can I use your credit card? And then you would say, uh, okay, but only if you return the book on time, okay? Now that is not something that I can enforce. But it just goes to show that these are something that they are thinking of, this is what they think about naturally. So out of 60 people, we got 220 suggestions. It comes really easy, apparently. Talk about 85 different unique assets per from personal data, IoT, services, social media, and what have you, many diverse use cases. And for all these examples, we found that 70% of what they want have existing APIs. Now, they are not necessarily in Thinkpedia today, but they are available. And 15% are uh, APIs that we should create because people find useful. There's only 9% that is out of scope and 6% that is unenforceable. So I, we were very surprised that about 85% of what people want and care about is already in the scope of a very simple formal language that I just showed you. And we also, you know, we build a prototype. It's a, and, and we asked, a, it's a fully working prototype. It's a prototype, it's not a product. It means, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit rough, but we use this to do a user study, and we find that a good number of them, we, it's a relatively small study, 20 people, and, um, and, and there are a lot of people who like the concept, they even like the app, and some even say they, use the, uh, they would use the app. And when we asked them, when we showed all this, they summarized what our app can do in three little words. They said, I get it, it is really about sharing without passwords. What it means is that today, people want to share accounts and they just give passwords to their friends. And when you give a password to your friend, that means they can do anything they want with, your, with, with that password. Suppose you want your accountant to help you with your banking statements. You give them the password, they can, withhold, they can even withdraw money from the bank. But here, your virtual assistant can do all the work on behalf of the requester and return only the results. Um, so we, we apply Genie to this, uh, let the, the extension of ThinkTalk, and we got similar results, uh, which is about 90% for paraphrase sentences. We have also tried another experiment where we extended the language for aggregates. So for example, I can say to the virtual assistant, uh, tell me all the number of times I went to this particular restaurant or uh, the num total number of steps I took this week. So these are aggregate sentences, very, very natural. And again, we see this pretty high percentage. So what it suggests is that um, this methodology can be used by a lot more people to help increase the power, the natural language power of the virtual assistant. So in summary here is like what I have described today is a combination of programming concepts, distributed systems, HCI for sure, and obviously machine learning to do the neural network. And what we see here is that when you put all these things together, potentially you have a system that helps the end users to do things they couldn't do before. And what we truly believe in is that if you have an open platform, more tools like Genie to expand, you know, to, to get a lot more people to be able to build on top of the system, turn it a product, get real data, then it is possible that we can have a Thinkpedia that is a universal repository of all the digital interfaces, IOTs and services, and they are interoperable, allowing you to combine them programmatically, okay? And in the meantime, um, using you know, all these tools, we should be able to put in a lot of the concepts that we use in our own workflow into a language like ThinkTalk. We call it ThinkTalk++. And 
with all this information and all the data, you, we will, it is just a matter of time, have a neural network, we call it the Louis Net, the Linguistic User Interface Network, that can take any natural language and turn it into code that work on all the digital interfaces. Not just the public, but also the confidential interfaces that companies may have, okay? I truly believe it is just a matter of time. The only question is, who owns this technology? Is it a couple of companies, like what we have seen with Facebook and Google and Amazon? Or is this going to be open technology available to everybody? And um, in conclusion here, um, what I think we are seeing is the beginning of the emergence of artificial collective intelligence because we are able to now record detailed information about our workflow, our behavior, as well as, out as outcomes, using all the IOTs that we all have been building and a virtual assistant that summarizes all this information, and you add machine learning to it, you are going to have a lot of intelligence about the collective as a whole. With that, we will be able to automatically predict human behavior like never before. We'll be pro automating and refining all the professional services because they n capture what we are doing and what the outcome is. And with that, you can refine the process. And I think that it's really important that we now take action to protect the privacy and make this data available, the private the protected data available to scientists. If we don't do that, there will just be a small number of companies who have access to all this collective intelligence, and they will probably just be focusing on the uses that generate the most profit for them. Um, we have to open it up. There is a lot of projects that are good for the society that will not be done otherwise. And so in, gen and so in conclusion here, I really want to get as many people as possible to help focus on this problem and build a working open federated virtual assistant. Thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, Monica, for an exciting talk. So I'm going to start with the first question. So when I arrived in Europe, I think the first thing I sense is I hear a whole potpourri of natural languages. So you're going to have, you know, besides English, every little country, right? Well, big country, they're going to have Italian, Spanish, uh, French, you know. So how is that going to make it a lot tougher for your AI engine? Do you have to train for every single language or you have the corpus? Well, thank you. That's a very good question. And this is the reason why it is actually, this problem is so scary. <laughs> okay. How, so, you know, a lot of people, is this working? A lot of people here, you know, we've built software and we have to internationalize our software. And that's a non-trivial amount of work. Every single sentence you put into the web, you will have to translate it in all the languages that you want this app to be used. And today, we will use these translation services. Sometimes we start with Google, but we use translation services and turn them into the different languages. Um, and that's already expensive. Imagine in the next round where the interface is, expect to be, is expected to be natural language. Who has the ability to turn, to understand natural language in all the different um, you know, the different languages that you want to service. And this is the reason why I believe that there will only be, if, you, if it is all proprietary, there will only be a couple of companies that will be able to do this well, all right? Now, imagine, you know, I'm, you know, it's like everybody who needs to have a web presence or even dealing with their corporate partners and so forth, they will, they will have to struggle with this problem. The question is, is there a one company that they go to and get all their user interfaces translated? This company will be intercepting all the communications between the companies and their partners or their consumer uh, or their users. And this is what keeps me up at night. What I believe in is that if we open this up, you can crowdsource everything. Every company, every country will be able to handle their own kind of natural language processing. 
If you just look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia contains the details of every single corner of the world. Why? Because everybody is contributing to this open source repository that is available for everyone. And this is actually the reason why I believe that if we make it open source, we make it available to everybody crowdsource, we can actually build the best virtual assistant. Because today, you know, even Google is not translating all their, all their tools for, uh, for all the different languages. There are a lot of rare languages that are not served, and that's because there's no money in it. And that's why we need to have open source and we need to crowdsource it. Okay, let's take some questions. Raise your hands over there. Can you shout out loud? Oh, okay, that's the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Rea Sarkostov from Technical University of Munich. First of all, thank you very much for this very intriguing keynote. Now, uh, today in conventional programming, software verification validation is a huge issue, right? So if we have million lines of code, I think it's foreseeable that when you have a few lines of linguistically expressed um, suggestions, remarks, re requests, that you can overlook the implications. What, how to ensure that when you made thousands of those requests to your virtual personal assistant, that those are consistent, that, that you do not obtain certain yeah, negative implications or contradictions? Well, we will have to go through debugging. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and there is no difference when it comes to natural language. And um, so, for example, if I say, oh, my father can look at the, can go check my security camera, I, it will probably take you a, just a few more minutes before you realize it's like there is a negative implication. And we will go through debugging. Um, and I want to address the issue about the fact that natural language is obviously very informal and has a lot of ambiguity. And I believe that this is going to work for a very simple reason. We're not, not actually talking about natural language understanding. We are just trying to get the humans to talk to their, to their uh, machines. And we will be restricting our own language. It is to our benefit that the machine understands what we are talking about. We will be using simplified language. It's a little bit like when you talk to a dog. You, know? you just say, lie down, shake hands, and that's about it. You're not going to do very fancy sentences about how you can, um, you know, lie down. <laughs> I don't even know different words for it, <laughs> because we, we will learn how to use simplified language for that purpose. Um, something that I want to emphasize, and that is that um, it is very, very important that you get confirmation. If you look at me, if you look at my phone, I don't use Siri because it doesn't do a lot of confirmations. The last thing I want is for them to think that I'm calling somebody when I don't want to talk to that person, okay? So everything that we do here, we take the natural language, we parse it, we have a formal representation, we read it back for confirmation before we actually execute the code. Okay, no more questions? Over there. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, I'm James Garland from Trinity College Dublin. Uh, thanks, thanks for the talk, it's been very interesting. Uh, two areas really that uh, I wonder whether you've even had a chance to look at is really power and latency. Uh, latency being uh, just you speaking to, it's giving a response, for example, all the way through to actually doing that task. And then what power uh, are you using, uh, are you comparable to existing uh, voice assistants or have you even looked at power or is there a potential for looking at power in the future? A lot, of, a lot of questions in here. First of all, we are concentrating on text. We don't do voice to text. We just assume somebody else will be taking, taking care of that. And this is part of the reason why I think it, is, it needs collaboration from a lot of different academic groups as well as companies. Um, and we are focusing only on the translation to programs. We don't chit chat. And obviously people want their virtual assistants to chit chat with them and there are other people who work on those things. And I think what is important is that we work together um, on that. What was the other question? What was the other question, the first part? 
um, so are you talking about the licensing of the open source software? Latency. Like the latency. The latency, I'm sorry. So, um, so the first of all, you have to translate it into text. Um, and then the translation from the text to the code today, it is all done over the web. Um, it takes a couple of seconds. Um, and I, and what, and that is because right now all the training and all the collection is done in the cloud. And at some point, you will be able to do the inferencing locally as well. Um, it is not an issue. And I think that the right now the issue is, uh, is the correctness. And uh, for, to solve this problem, we also um, back that up with a graphical user interface so that it is, um, you know, you have a, an alternative. And I want to say that for people here, for the technical people, what I have found is that ThingTalk as a language is really useful. Regardless of what's going on with the natural language processing, I see the ThingTalk program, I can easily edit it and do what I want. And that is because it is a language that just connects all the devices together. You don't have to worry about the credentials, you don't have to worry about um, the, all the communication protocol between the different devices. And that is a way for us to build well, I, I think it is kind of a language for an IoT operating system, internet operating system. Mm -hmm. And I really want to um, urge people here in the audience to think about where are all the data from IoTs that we are making going to go? Okay, Are they going to go to a couple of companies? Or do we have a way for all these things to interoperate and they go to you know, different sources, different uh, aggregation points based on what the user wants. And I think this is a core system problem that um, we need to address. So with that, I think we'll have to wrap up and so that we can move on with the rest of the program. Let's, I'd like to present these gifts from Hypeak to Monica for accepting our invitation and giving such a great keynote. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. <laughs> Thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs>